Um, my name is Maxine Ponce Webster. I'm a producer at the British Library, and I'm thrilled to welcome you all to tonight's event. Tonight, we are, we are joined by the award winning trans writer and performer, Travis Alabanza. We're celebrating the upcoming release of their much anticipated memoir, None of the Above, in which, yeah, <laughs> in which they explore what it means to live outside the gender boundaries imposed on us by society. We're especially pleased to be hosting Travis at this time, as the British Library has just opened a display in our Treasures Gallery, which is just over there, entitled Proud Words. This features magazines, memoirs, and manifestos from the 1970s to 1990s, created by LGBTQ plus people, using culture to form new communities and create a new language to define themselves. It's free to visit at any time until the end of October. This evening, we're in the entrance hall of the British Library. As well as all of you who are gathered here tonight, we're being joined by audiences online and in libraries in Rugby and Norwich through the Living Knowledge Network, our partnership of national and public libraries. Hello and welcome to you. Those of you who are watching online can submit questions via the form just below the video and we'll read out as many as we can later on. On your webpage, you can also buy a copy of None of the Above from the British Library Bookshop. Those of you here in the room can obviously also ask questions. Just raise your hand when prompted, but please wait for the microphone so that those watching online can hear you. You'll also be able to pick up a, a copy of Travis's book at the bookshop tonight, ahead of its publication next week, and have it signed. So on to our speakers. Our host for this evening is Rennie Edo Lodge. Rennie Edo Lodge, yeah. <laughs> Rennie Edo Lodge is an award-winning journalist, author, and podcaster who published the acclaimed Why I'm No Longer Talking to White People About Race in June 2017. The book went on to be a Sunday Times and New York Times bestseller, winning numerous accolades. And in 2020, it became the first book by a black British author to top the UK book charts. I'm sure that you're all aware with Travis's work, but their impressive achievements are worth reiterating. After being the youngest recipient of the Artist in Residency program at Tate Galleries, Travis's debut theatre show, Burgers, toured internationally to sold out performances in the South Bank Centre, Sao Paulo, Brazil, and Berlin, and won the Edinburgh Fringe Total Theatre Award. In 2020, their show Overflow debuted at the Bush Theatre to widespread acclaim and was later streamed online in over 20 countries. Travis has spoken around the world and their writing has appeared in The Guardian, Vice, Gaudem, BBC Online and Metro and in numerous anthologies, including Black and Gay in the UK. Please welcome to the stage, Rennie Edo Lodge and Travis Alabanza. <laughs> Hello everyone, um, my name's Rennie um, and uh, I am delighted to share this evening with you all. You know, it's beautiful weather out there. You could be in a beer garden, you could be in a park, but you're here with us, which means that you're dedicated to the pursuit of, you know, social justice and thinking and I really respect that. Um, but another person that I respect as much as I respect you all is Travis Alabanza, who's written this beautiful sort of interesting, soul-searching work of narrative non-fiction, of which I got to have an early peek of, an early read, and so I'm delighted to, um, to talk to you today about it. But first, Travis, I think you said you wanted to do a reading. God forbid. <laughs> Everyone should go to the beer garden now, shouldn't they? No, afterwards, <laughs> afterwards. And when you're in the beer garden, you can discuss what you've heard today. Yeah, um, but for now, you're, you're gonna, Hit us with some of those words. Yeah, so I'll just say that this is from the last chapter of the book, um, which is titled, This is for us, baby, not for them. And it's coming right near the end. My transness is the gift. I say it back to myself now. I know how true those words still feel. Despite the crossroads I feel over what to do with my body and my identity, it is unquestionable that I still believe in the gift it means to be trans. 
Transness has taught me so much about choice, love and consent, that through reclaiming and retelling the ways we want to talk about our own bodies, we can open windows to other parts of our life. I think about what I mean when I say it is a gift. It has brought me so many friendships and so much creativity and community to my door. Transmus makes it impossible not to be aware of how even the things that seem the most fixed can change. That if you are unhappy about something given to you without a choice, there is a world in which you can change it. It is a gift to know that. In a world that is fueled by capitalism that rids us of so much freedom, it does not feel obtuse to say that to know there is choice within ourselves and our body is a gift. When I think about transness being a gift, I instantly think of the best people that I know in the world and how it is not coincidental that they are trans as well. Rather, it makes complete sense. For four years of my life, I lived in a house of black trans people. And although I resist the urge to homogenize us, there were certain gifts of living together that felt distinct because of our shared experiences. Whether it was the way we existed in public together, turning walks to tube stops into main stage events, or our ability to bend the rules of language within our conversations about ourselves and each other. I know the depth found within our relationships was only made possible for our daring to be trans, and such daring feels like a gift in a world punctuated with shallow tendencies. Like a gift of knowledge or truth, not everyone can handle what it shows or is always ready for what it may mean, yet that does not stop it from being a gift. When I think of transness as a gift, I cannot help but think in a spiritual way, partly because of the religious connotations of the word gift and knowledge, yet also because it helps ground me in something that is beyond the violence, reminding myself that in different times and locations, gender nonconformity was not pun punished in the same way, that living outside gender binaries was seen by some as connecting with something higher, as a gift almost, confirms to me that this current moment can change that it is not predetermined that my transness shall be persecuted, that there is a historical power in our gift, even if others are too afraid to stare directly at it. I think about how absurd it would be to give a gift to someone every year on their birthday, only for them to smash it up in front of you every time that you do, that each year you spend hours perfecting what will be their gift, pouring love and care into how it is formed, even writing a card explaining what it means to you and them, only for them to just smash it every single time. You would not go back to them. You would not put so much effort into ensuring they received another gift. You would, instead, someone, find someone else who would receive your gift with open arms, who would give you something else back in exchange, and who would celebrate all it took for you to bring such a gift to the table. I do not want to base my transness on cisgender people's definition of it. I do not want to define myself in relation only to them. I do not want to play by their rules of what my gender should look like. If my transness is a gift, let it be protected by those who will cherish it. This is for us, baby, not for them. Thank you. Thank you for that, Travis. Um, so, we were discussing backstage, like, about what the theme of these questions are going to be, and, and I mentioned to you that um, as a person who writes and communicates for a living, I'm really, really interested in words. Um, and so, the first question I want to ask you is about a word that you use that comes up quite a few times in the book. It's the word liminal. Mm. Um, and I understand the word liminal in relation to like a liminal space to essentially mean somewhere that you are on your way to somewhere, on your, this is not a good explanation. When you're, it's a place that you're in that is taking you somewhere. I don't know, like, so for example, I would use being on the tube or yeah. being perhaps on a plane or an airport as a liminal space. Um, you know, it's essentially a, a place of transition, supposedly taking you from A to B, right? Mm. Um, and I'm really interested in your definition of liminal as it relates to the subject matter of, um, of none of the above, and let us know how it 
sort of relates to your being non-binary? Yeah. Um, so obsessed that I'm starting with this question. I've been craving something about the words in the book for so long, so... Okay, great, well... I didn't need to drink really, two I wines. I analyse. <laughs> um, I think for me, what I think about when I think of liminal and why I wanted to put it so distinctly in the book is obviously trans is an umbrella term, but something I wanted to write specifically about was how to exist. The question I'm asking in the book is, can I survive as a visibly gender non-conforming person? that is deciding that I'm not man or woman. Is that possible to still survive as that in 40 years? And I realized that one of the main reasons why that was struggling is because of how people project onto you that this can never be permanence. This is, has to be something that you're moving towards. This is your halfway house. Even if they understand non-binary in theory, as an aesthetic or as your perceived appearance and your gender, they assume that you're finishing something up. And I feel like when you're in a liminal space in gender, you aren't awarded the same privileges of when you're in a static space, right? It feels like you can't access certain spaces until you choose to make something definite. And so for me, it was really important to distinguish the type of trans I was talking about, because I feel like although all types of trans people are harassed and abused systemically and personally in different ways, when you're occupying a space that people can't place, you receive a specific type of violence that I felt wasn't spoken about. But also, when you then go out and look for that support from others in your community, sometimes you can face a lack of understanding. It's so interesting because we talk about different services and support and how to include trans people into already existing services. But what happens if you exist in a space beyond the language of those services and still need them? And those are the kind of questions I was asking, like when I'm 30 or 40, maybe I'll be tired of being outside. But also I see liminal as a place of in-between and a place of movement. And then I was feeling like I was in this static of lockdown and suddenly it almost felt like, this sounds weird, but it felt like my body was still charging somewhere forward. And I was like, is this intentional? Am I wanting to move somewhere else? Or do I feel mm. like I'm being forced to go somewhere else because of someone else, you know? Yeah, I mean, because, you know, when I, you know, kept reading that word li liminal, I was thinking, is, are you going somewhere? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Is that the intention? <laughs> or, are, or when you, because I think what's really interesting about this book is that, you know, it sits in the questions, right? It sits in the questions, it doesn't really try to you're not out here setting out a stall, do you know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, to me, I think that word liminal also, at least for me, and you know, this could be my own personal projection, but comes, there's an insecurity, right? Oh, yeah. You know, because there isn't that, I'm here, that settledness. Mm. Yeah. Right? This, this book was 100% written from doubt. I, I say that as I think the dedication in the book says, this is dedicated to all people questioning, unsure, mm -hmm. in doubt. And there was a version of this where I, I didn't plan for this book to be like this. I say it in the prologue, but I thought the book was gonna kind of be that, tell all, this is how you understand non-binary people, mm -hmm. a chapter on pronouns, maybe a chapter on email signatures and a chapter on blue hair dye. <laughs> um, and I started writing that book because I thought that would be the book that people need or want. And then, Conveniently, at the same time, I was having a gender crisis for like the first time in a long time. You know, I've been out as gender non-conforming for, for 10 years and I felt very not liminal in my mm. gender. And suddenly I was using the advance from the book to get laser hair surgery. Mm. And I was like, hold on a minute, this is the same person that used to comment on bathroom walls saying I'm bearded and a faggot and proud and suddenly I was like I want to change. Mm. But you had an advance and that gave you options. <laughs> suddenly money drops into the account. Money drops into the account but it's yeah. real right you know trans healthcare requires money in this mm -hmm. country or waiting for a million years and the first thing I did when I had the privilege of a, the, a lump sum was go I'm gonna burn off all my hair and I didn't even think. Mm. And I was like hold on a minute I'm not even thinking about something that's incredibly painful and also, like, I'm not good at pain threshold, even with people I know, let alone a stranger. Um, and I suddenly had all this doubt, and I messaged my editor at the time and said, 
I don't think I can write the book telling everyone what non-binary is mm. because I'm not sure in 10 years if I'm going to be here, like this space. Instead, I'm going to spend some time speaking to my friends and seeing how they feel about their gender. And what I learned is that so many of us were having these internal battles, questioning our validity, but felt like because of the current conversation around transness, we couldn't say that in public. Mm. Because of how scrutinized transness was, we couldn't question ourselves out loud. We had to come robust and clear and not liminal. Mm. And I said, I've got this chance to write something from a place of doubt, which is a natural human emotion that we all feel mm -hmm. that transness shouldn't be stripped of. And I get to put that out there. So that was the choice, yeah. So I'm glad that mm. it feels like it's from a place of doubt because it definitely is. <laughs> yeah, I think yeah. sometimes you just know what you don't want, you yeah. know? Yeah. Um, and that, it's okay to move from that position, right? Yeah. Okay, so it's kind of come up in your reading and in that answer about, um, you know, the, I feel like one of the themes in none of the above, and you can challenge me because it's your writing at the end of the day, that I came away from it thinking like, that one of the main themes is the idea of trans being an, an being trans, essentially being an imposition. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like, you know, you write about, um, and I think it's quite pertinent that you mentioned that, you know, the crisis came in lockdown, because you write about this imposition essentially being in relation to others, right? To being in relation to, yeah. like, the dominant values of society. Am I right in thinking that's a main theme? Absolutely. Okay, I good, was, good. I'm uh, a good reader. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you definitely are. <laughs> um, um, yeah, absolutely. I think that, I don't know about you, but sometimes I write from a place of what I think is missing in literature. Not mm. always, I don't think that always births the best stuff. But you read a lot and you go, oh, it's missing this, it's missing mm -hmm. that. And I felt like with this, one thing I was feeling when I was reading the trans nonfiction that was coming out um, in 2000, you know, this is like pre-2020, 2019, mm. 18, 17 years, is rightfully so, a lot of it was about this personal journey of finding yourself mm -hmm. and everything was about the journey you go on to accept yourself and that was great and uplifting, but that wasn't my narrative. My narrative was I was fine and then you came along. Mm. I was living free as a gender non-conforming kid and person, and then I met adults, and then I met systems, mm -hmm. and then I met structures, and suddenly I was thinking about gender. I was lucky enough to live in a family where my choices weren't policed heavily, mm. and so I wasn't thinking about wearing a heel or wearing a dress, or if I was a boy or a girl. I was just seen for my personality and mm -hmm. my being. I then go to school and suddenly it all changes. And suddenly I have these feelings of wrongness in my body. And it's not the same for everyone. And I, who knows, it could be a chicken or egg. But for me, I was like, I think it does a disservice to us as a community of trans people, but also as a wider society to take the onus completely off of the other person. To put it completely on transness personalizes an issue that has to be in relation, gender is relational mm. in everyone, not just trans people, we're constantly, gender's a relational project, but also more than that, I think it lets cisgender people off the hook because it makes my transition wholly a personal thing. Whereas actually if cisgender people left us alone, our genders would look very different. Our gender expression would feel different. Our access to ourselves would feel different. And so I wanted a book that really said, my transition is not just in relation to me, it's transitioning away from you, or it's transitioning around you, or it's transitioning to deal with you, mm -hmm. but it is to do with you. So it came, I feel like when I was like writing that question, I was thinking about like the rigidity of the gender binary and how, you know, that is the imposition. Yeah. You know? Um, so one thing, you're a performer, right? Like, that's a day job? Some, well, it hasn't been recently. Oh, no, I'm triggered. <laughs> I mean, I'm oh, sorry. Imagine, no, 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 I'm joking. You've had I'm to joking. have your head down, no, no, typing. I'm typing. Yeah, it's been Which a day a, job. It's been a night job. Yeah. It's, I think, like, writing is so... Um, I mean, I saw you perform once at Glastonbury P Pandemic, and I was, like, blown away. And I thought about the fact that, you know, the job of writing is just, it's very solo. It's, um, 
you know, it lends itself to the to introversion. Um, yeah. And so you say you haven't been performing that much, and you know, you've been working on edits, tap, typing away. Um, but I'm really interested, I think, in terms of uh, you know, you being a performer and how you know others relate to you. So you tell this really fascinating story in the book, which I feel like this is your first like London book event, so I can ask you to retell it. Yeah. Are you? Oh my god. Okay, yeah. good. Because you want about Steve? If the, yeah. If yeah. this was like your eighth event, I'd be like, I'm not going to ask because you'll be you tired got the of fresh it. Right one. Now. You're good. Okay. So yeah, can you tell us about Steve? Yeah, um, Steve. If you're out in the audience, I changed your name. Um, <laughs> So I say in the book, I changed the name to Steve, but he did look like a Steve. Right. And at first, the thing about Steve, right, I used to gig back in like 2016, 17, I was working mainly in cabaret and club circuit, and I was performing like five days a week with a lot of different shows and different clubs. And um, Steve would be at every single one. And he was a straight dude. Now I later got that confirmed, but I held my hands up. I did make some assumptions. He was straight, I looked at his shoes. And <laughs> And he would just sit at the side of the stage and watch me silently every single show and then just leave. And he stood out. No like moving, sort of, no, no vibing. No, oh, no. Steve was like... OK. And I couldn't tell if he liked it, but then, like, every now and again, he would go... <laughs> and I'd be like... <laughs> and it kind of became like a little thing between me and him. I'd see him mm. at the bar and I'd be like, is he, like, flirting? Then I felt like I was a bit of attracted to him, but we'll process that in another book. Um, <laughs> and then... He started talking to me after the show, but he'd just come up to me and say, hi, I'm Steve. Then he'd, discla- he'd say he's straight. He'd be like, hi, I'm Steve, I'm straight, I'm sorry, which, correct response. And, <laughs> and then he would run away. And I, was, I would talk about him all the time with my friends because I just wanted him to stay. I was so mm-hmm. thankful, one, that like, by this point, I didn't have any regulars. So I was like, I'll take any regular I can get. <laughs> and his energy was gorgeous. And then one day he turned up with who later revealed was his wife. I did feel a pang of jealousy, <laughs> which I don't know. Yeah, again, another book. Um, and he shows me his nails instantly. And it was the weirdest interaction because I'm like, this guy's never spoken to me, shows me his nails. He's, and then his wife kind of interrupts him and goes, this is Steve and I'm his wife, Samantha, and he's painted his nails because of you. This is because of you. Right, well, I had that response first, definitely. I was like, oh, this is beautiful. Like, what a great impact. And I talk about this in the book. God, does that phrase ever get weird going to No, me? no you've got it's to do fine. It. Okay, you talk, own it now. I talked about it in the book. But <laughs> it was art at first, right? And it was beautiful. But then something interesting happened where I learned that they've been debating whether he can paint his nails, and this is the language, we've debating whether or not he can do it for the last five years. We've been having these conversations in our marriage and we're deciding whether we could allow it. Right. And suddenly my heart, like, sinks. And they're still smiling and feeling proud, and they walk off. And I don't see them at my shows ever again. Um, although I'm sure c- I've got two bigger venues now, so it's hard, <laughs> hard to tell. Um, but I think it's a really important... I put that in the story of the book because I think it sums up really clearly the gender binary in lots of ways. One, it shows the joy that gender nonconformity can bring to other people. It shows that when gender nonconformity is allowed to exist and be celebrated and be lauded, it has a positive effect on other people's freedom. That actually cisgender people gain autonomy from trans people being free. And that the more trans people... Yeah, you can clap, bitch, I like that. And that the more trans people are allowed to be free, we'll see a side effect of other people's freedom that freedom's contagious, that when we see other people make choices about things that we think are unmovable, suddenly we open up to a world of possibilities. That's the positive, right? Steve painting his nails showed me that unlike I was meant to believe that transness is a bad plague, that actually transness spreads in a beautiful way, in a positive way. But the side effect of that was showing that when you make conversations and choices for your autonomy under the gender binary, it's not just trans people that are punished that cis men's acceptance and romance and love is conditional on them performing malehood perfectly, right? And that shows that the gender binary isn't just harming trans people, it's robbing all of us of the chance to be more free. Steve had to leverage his own choice in order to still have love. And to me, I had to put that in the book because it was both confirming of what I believe about myself, but also depressingly confirming 
about what I believe the effects are on other people. I think the media has done an incredible, successful job of isolating trans issues as an us for them situation, mm. right? Instead of saying that actually trans people are being honest about the illness of a gender binary, right? and that trans people are showing the reaction and the bravery to react to something that is harming all of us. And that's why Stephen Samantha is important. And if they do show up, or if he is watching, I want them to know, I do say it in the book, but the story is told with such love and such thankfulness. Mm. And he bought me free drinks over two weeks, so thank you, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's really important. I also thought it was, you know, interesting that, you know, before Steve identified himself as, like, straight and cis, you'd sort of made that a sort of assumption on signifiers, right? Yeah. And I think it's really like, you know, that speaks to the gender binary as well and the fact mm. that, like, you know, what does, what does the mind do? Mm. Like, reaches for reference points, you know? Mm. Um, Birkenstocks. Yeah, I mean, I'm wearing them. <laughs> but, well, they've Are these brought them back. We brought them back. Is this a straight... Is this a, is this a thing? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, <it is. laughs> you open that one up. I know. <laughs> but, and it's all good. Listen, this event's not about me. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> so, you wrote something... Uh, here's a line that I pulled from um, the book that I think very much resonated with me. You wrote... We sacrifice a complexity that is within all of us in an attempt to appease a binary that we believe keeps us safe. And when you wrote about Steve and his wife, you used the phrase victim of the gender binary. And I, I thought, what does it mean to be a victim of the gender binary in that way? Yeah, I think I intentionally used that word, again, to kind of hop back on what I just said, to a I knew I wasn't silly to the context that this book is coming out in. Mm. I know you try and write to, I, I don't know if you had this, but when you're writing your work, that sometimes it's helpful to just imagine you're writing this for yourself. But obviously Always. you have to then go, this is gonna be read by these people, this mm -hmm. people, these things. And we're in this country at this time. So I was really aware that as a trans author, I was writing in this anti-trans climate. And I was aware that this wouldn't be a book that might be where my other previously self-published works are in like a queer safe space library. Mm -hmm. It can be in the British Library, which is feeling safe today, thank you. <laughs> um, um, but I knew that context, and so I knew that I wanted to make certain points really clear. And the main point I wanted to make clear was that we have been duped to think that trans people are the only ones suffering. And that actually, like organizers from the past, I was drawing inspiration from organizers of different marginalized groups. Solidarity is crossing lines. Solidarity is saying my issues, your issues. Solidarity is showing all the ways that we're both struggling under the same system. And so for me, to use the phrasing victim of a gender binary, it's saying we're all in this. And this book is explaining how I'm specifically being harmed by this, but this language hints to you that you are as well. So instead of us being separated and instead of us being at each other, mm -hmm why don't we share resources because we're being harmed by the same thing. And actually the resource that helps you might also help me or we can work that, to share resources, right? Mm. And it really was, when, I read, when I'd written this, I imagined like my mum reading it, my aunties reading it, old school feminists reading it and wanting them to feel like I was saying, hey, I'm trying to show that this is a thing between us mm. and to show that trans people aren't unique in that we are facing violence from gender. Mm. And that although we have an individual experience, that when we start realizing that we're all being harmed from a similar thing, just at different angles, maybe we can create some actual change, you know? I think that's a very generous and open-hearted approach. And I can tell you that that's not an approach that I would ever take to <laughs> try and find so, you know, common ground with some of these people who are say, saying awful things, you know? So I really admire that. I think, look, I don't have that hope on the streets, you know? <laughs> if, if someone comes to me on the streets, I haven't got that hope. But I had time with this. And I think about a book is, for me, it lasts, well, it does last forever. You know that when you're writing it, you're like, mm. this is going to be here in 10 years. Maybe my rage won't be here in 10 years, so what other emotions do I want to say? And I think 
it sounds cheesy as hell, but I wanted some hope that I do believe that there's more bringing us together in solidarity than there isn't. And that I've spent loads of time reacting to all the noise about transness mm. and that wasn't bringing me any more joy. And of course, it's quite exhausting. It's so exhausting. Mm. And it, I it learned leads the hard way. <laughs> you, yeah, yeah, real. And it leads to nowhere. Mm. It just doesn't lead anywhere. And the good thing about writing in solitude, you mentioned like writing as a solitude, I found it so hard. You're right, I'm a performer. I kept on being like to my flatmate at the time, can I just give you a monologue inspired by the book? <laughs> <laughs> like just we play charades, in, you know? Voice notes, <laughs> yeah. yeah, three words, first word, none. <laughs> um, <laughs> but the good thing about writing in solitude is I'm not seeing all of those like mm -hmm. people. They're not around me. I was in my home. So I could almost build this like idyllic scenario where they listen mm. and write to that. And if they don't, that's their choice, but I've given a chance for that. Of you course. Know? And also I think, sorry, I'm going on, but... No, you, this is your event to go on. Like, that's why we're here. <laughs> <laughs> but also I didn't just, I didn't really just write for a cis reader. For me, the book also had to really speak to my community. Mm. And I think if I was always, I had to reach a hand in generosity because then the feeling of, this sounds so corny, but I do believe this in writing, the feeling of hope like goes through it and the feeling of when I'm talking about really negative things, someone can still grab to something. And I knew that this book would hopefully bring joy and a sense of um, confirming feels to trans people. But I also knew that some bits would be hard because I haven't ignored the violence. Mm. And so I needed an energy that would pull them through the read as well. Absolutely. You know? yeah. I thought it was quite interesting. You know, I decided not to ask you about the media climate because it's, you know, this is about your work. It's not about, you know, caricatures of what it means to be trans in Britain from a bunch of transphobic columnists, you know. But I thought it was quite, you know, interesting how you wrote about uh, the threat of physical violence, you know, the ongoing rhetorical violence that's happening in the British press and how, you know, you confronted your own um, sort of disconnection and disassociation from those moments because it is really hard yeah. to sit down and talk about and write about some of the uh worst things that have happened to you in your life um and i'm not equating uh the threat of rhetorical violence to the same as the threat of physical violence but i've definitely been through something similar where it's really quite devastating because the aim of it is essentially to trash your reputation you know um and i really admired that because it is really difficult to get that out and there's no institutional support. Your publisher doesn't pay for therapy to help you, you know, move through that, that, that painful writing. I wondered how you managed to do it. Like, mm. had, what, did you lean on any resources or any people? White wine. Okay. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, well, look, I think the main, obviously there's a whole chapter where I use, spoiler alert, there's a chapter called Children Sacrifice to Appease the Trans Lobby, which is a headline written by Janice Turner in the Sunday Times newspaper in 2017, and I was the subject of the article. And that was about me getting kicked out of a changing room in Topshop when I was very young, and it went viral and da 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 da. And I have to glaze over it now because I've, I went in and chose to go in during the book. But mm. when that all happened, I was receiving lots of requests to talk on Good Morning Britain, to mm -hmm. respond and become a thinking, talking head, mm. and I declined every single thing and never spoke about it really. Mm. Like spoke about it in my own way, in my work, but never had a public platform. And I'm so glad I declined it at the time because I didn't want to, I was busy being in a play. I wanted mm -hmm. to be known for my work. But here I had the chance to do it on my own terms and do mm. it with time. And I felt like if I said it and gave a whole chapter to it, two things could happen. One, maybe I don't need to write about it again, because it kept on appearing in bits of my work. In Burgers, it gets like a line, and something else, mm -hmm. it gets a line. And I was like, oh, this clearly needs to happen. Let me just give it space. And then the second thing that I could do that I think you can only do in the arts is you get to imagine alternative endings, mm. and you get to imagine different autonomy. So again, spoiler alert, but in the book, I cut up the headline, and I re-cross out words, and rewrite it to have a different ending that I believe better sums up what's happening in that thing. And I get to speak back to her. Because that was the thing, I was 20 years old and she's a 
40 plus women it's really in the excessively column. cruel it was cruel mm. it was really mean and i didn't have the resources to mm. fight back i'd never been in the press before mm. that that was my first time really experiencing any attention i didn't have i'm sure if it happened now i suddenly through privilege have access to calling up someone who might know a pr person mm. or calling up a friend who has been through press too but you know i was 20 years old and mm. i didn't know anyone in those places and i was like what's going on and this chapter was really healing i mean i get it's the only time i still get really it's still real because mm. it's real because no matter how much you write about it no one should go through that mm and certainly not in the name of writing. And as one writer to apparently another writer, it was just so upsetting. But then let me do the shade back how I know how with a solid piece of writing. Mm. You know, she gets torn a new one, mm. but all done through legal. <laughs> <laughs> okay, how much time we've got left? Okay, this is good. My final question. And we've got time. We've got questions. Please have questions. Yeah. So... Well, that was desperate, actually. Turn it out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Get the cogs yeah. turning, people. OK, so I think related to what we've just discussed, you know, we've spoken about a few things during our conversation, right? Like, I think you're a really fascinating person to talk to because, you know, as a performer, like, so much of your work is about creative self-expression, right? Like in your, in, in your performance, like in your fashion sense, in your writing. And I think that like creative self-expression is part of gender, right? But it's not yeah. all of it. Yeah. I was discussing this with my partner today before I came down and I was like, yeah, like I want to ask Travis a question about creative self-expression because like it's linked. And I feel like, you know, I'm really interested in the idea of like, your creative self-expression being perceived by the dominant society as a provocation, mm. as a challenge, you know? Because it's something that I experience with my work, and I just feel that, for example, a white nature writer who's doing their work, uh, who's expressing themselves creatively through their passions, doesn't get their work, you know, seen as a um, provocation. Well, actually, maybe with climate change a little bit, but, <laughs> you know, in the same way, like, um, and, you know, I picked that up really, like, I've picked it up very strongly, like, in, in your book, like, the idea of essentially being, you know, seen as a provocation simply because of who you are and how you want to express yourself creatively. And I wondered if you wanted to say a little bit more about that, because, you know, in an ideal world, creative self-expression would be encouraged, it would be considered pedestrian and benign and we would all just enjoy it but yeah. there is something so I think suffocating about constantly be seeing as a provocation yeah. that was a bit of a long question no that was the best people I'm sorry <laughs> not to gas you up that, in front of you. that was the best question ever oh, I'm, <laughs> um, I'm so glad we're ending on it because I feel like what gets missed out in conversations around transness and our transition is that like we're carving ourselves in front of the world that takes work, but also it takes skill, it takes craft, and it takes power, and aesthetic is that. Mm. And it's devalued as this kind of uh, fluffy thing that doesn't have weight, or is for them, rather than like a deep personal commitment to yourself mm. to bring joy and to bring a self-empowerment that isn't flimsy, the least flimsy, for self-empowerment feels like such a flimsy word, but the end of the day is that I, have, I make a choice every day to say, despite what I'm going to experience outside on the streets for looking like this, this choice is worth more, and the joy that this feels is worth more than what I might experience. That should be given joy and celebration, not punishment. Mm. We should be able to learn from trans people doing that. But also, aesthetic and, and creative self is the only way I found my voice. You know, like, class is such a big thing for me in this book, right? There's a whole chapter about the, the council estate. And I feel like part of the thing of growing up on a council estate, and I don't want to harp on too much about it, but because I feel like the way we talk about Britain in class, it just becomes this stereotype in our image, and there's so many nuances that get missed. But part of the thing of growing up on a council estate is 
my experience was that often you can feel like that is the only place you could ever be and that is the only place you'll ever be and that the brick houses and walls will just carry on going forever and ever and ever and ever. And it wasn't until I found creative expression and choice to how I adorn myself and how I present. I remember editing my school uniform when I was younger and just like getting a huge black flares and like a crop polo shirt, doing the jumper over the top, a million bangles. How was that received? Yeah. Was, but, how did the school Oh, they that? said you're wearing a million items over the school uniform. <laughs> And I said, I'm either here or I was, I loved an excuse to bunk. So mm -hmm. I was like, it's either this or not me. And they eventually got bored. But doing that, it was so weird, but it told me that I had options beyond what I was told. Mm. I didn't get that from books. I didn't get that from hearing another trans person speak. I didn't get that from online or anything. I got that from creative expression on myself. Mm. And so I'm so glad you picked up on it because we can get lost in all the seriousness of like the head stuff and forget that this is serious too, but it's also fun. I love looking like this. I fought for my book to be pink. Mm. <laughs> I fought for my book to look chic mm. and I will be wearing pink at every single book tour. And that will seem frivolous and it will also bring me such comfort and joy and fun. Mm. And like not everything else can do that in the world. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. But it is linked to the head stuff to some extent because course, yeah. there's that, I think as people who, and I hesitate to call myself a marginalized person now, my class has changed, yeah, no. but you know, my position, my political perspective is still somewhat marginalized, right? So, I mean, very much so. I mean, we've got candidates for Tory leadership saying they're gonna shut it down, but <laughs> I think it's quite, um, you know, it's linked to the head stuff because not everybody's creative self-expression is seen as a threat and a challenge to the yeah. status quo, you know? Yeah. Taylor Swift can just write her songs mm. and perform them, and that's her, you know, she's a talented songwriter, and that's her genuine self-expression mm. of how she wants to express herself creatively, and like, no one's busy yeah. saying that it's an abomination, it has to end, but for those of us who, who come from a perspective that's marginalized, you don't have that freedom. Yeah. You can do it, but be ready for the avalanche yeah. of, you know, oh, well, why are you doing that for? Obviously, you're doing it for the dominant, you know, you know, the people in dominant society, you know, they pick it up as an invitation mm -hmm. to lean in with their own fears, you know, and their own projections. And that's how it's linked to the head stuff because it's, we don't have that freedom. We don't yeah. have that freedom in the same way. And that's why I think I ended on the, the chapter order wasn't always the same, but I mm. think that's why I ended on the chapter that says, this is for us, baby, not for them. Mm. Because they'll try and make it as if this is all for them. Mm -hmm. But then when I walk down the street now, sometimes you have to play games to get through it, right? And sometimes I go, let me imagine that this is for any other GNC person that sees me and nods and gets mm -hmm. it back. Let me imagine that this is to inspire that person or to nod at that. And it changes your whole shift because you're like, this can still be other f for other people that feel good. It can be for you, and then it can also be other people that feel good, but it's about who it's for. And that they can control a lot of things, but they can't control what shoes I'm gonna wear. Mm. They can't control what outfit I'm gonna boss in. And uh, I'd like to see Taylor pull this off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. We've How we doing? We're really doing good for time. Nice. We've got plenty of time for questions, so I hope the cogs in all of your minds have been turning and you have insightful things to contribute to our discussion. Um, I think we've also got some questions coming from the internet. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I guess, uh, yeah. Has anybody got a question? Okay, so we've I got some hands. I'm going to go to elephant t-shirt first and let's keep it to a question and not a statement. Um, so you know the phrase, have to see it to be it. So in what you just answered right now, you were saying how like creative expression and you were doing that in school, whereas like, how did you find it? to know who you were that early as opposed to having to wait to see 
lots of other trans and gender non-conforming people to give you the power to do that. Hmm. Uh, does that yeah, make yeah, sense? That makes oh, sense. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A brilliant question. Thank a you. Great question. Thank you, Elephant T-shirt. <laughs> um, lovely T-shirt. <laughs> um, I like it. <laughs> I guess I don't know because I can't compare it to the other option. But what I will say is that I wasn't doing it with a knowledge of transness. I was just doing myself. Mm. And it wasn't about, at that point, it really, and again, this is probably different for lots of different trans people. But for me, my experience was I wasn't thinking anything internally. It was really, I was on simple vibe. I was like, this looks good on me. This feels good. I want to wear this. I was like, this school uniform is dead. Uh, how can I liven it up? And I think it was both good and bad. Bad, I want to end on the good. So bad in the sense that I think it made me quite bashful because maybe I didn't understand there is a sanctity to it. So maybe I was interacting with other trans and queer people that were older than me and they were trying to reach out because they were seeing all the signifiers. And I was like, whatever, I'm off to go. I was playing on the football team at the same time, you know? She was complex. Um, <laughs> so I was, I wasn't paying attention to that. So I think it made me a bashful person. I was also experiencing so much violence but wasn't processing it because I was like no grounding of why I was do why it was happening because I really was oblivious but good in the sense that it meant that I knew that's possible to have and it meant oh, that was me sorry um <laughs> it meant that I can always imagine a future where we're less bothered because I was less bothered and that it does also mean that I think I relate to our community in a certain way I think that obviously I say our community and we're completely multifaceted, da, 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 all of those prefaces. But sometimes we can get bogged down by things that I don't always feel necessarily aid us. Um, I think we can sometimes get bogged down in how we define ourselves to each other, how we relate to each other consistently through certain languages and language and signifiers. And we can forget that to me, our transness is like a verb, it's an action, it's a doing thing. And when I remember me in the past, I think this was an action and this felt the best when it was an action. It didn't feel the best when I was theorizing myself in relation to someone else. And to be honest, it had to do this book. That was the gender crisis. I was like, I'm thinking about this too much and I'm not doing. And the me in the schools was just doing. And so my advice for a lot of young trans people when I'm asked, not, that's not you, by the way, I'm looking at you like, you're not that, but like when a young trans person, oh, you are young, okay, you can never, hey, babes, you can never know, you know, trans really more age, you know? Uh, so I think that when I go into schools and stuff and trans young people ask me like similar questions, I just tell them to try it out safely somewhere, wherever that context is, try before thinking and you'll figure that stuff out. And maybe that's, I don't know, maybe that works for some people, but that's what I hold on to to that younger self is I was just doing, and it felt so good a lot of the time. Of course, there was a lot of shit, but like, sorry, I just told not to sweat Sorry, too much. library network. Sorry, library network at home. Sorry, mum. <laughs> um, but it felt good. Yeah, it felt good. Brilliant. I feel like we had a question over here. Okay, yes. And remember, question, not statement. Oh, uh, yeah, hi. Um, well, you mentioned that your cover is pink, and I was actually going to ask a question about the cover. Uh, Dad? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you obviously have a way with words. Sorry, statement. <laughs> no, it's all right, as long as there's a question coming. Okay, cool, yeah. <laughs> um, i got to bring you to every one. Like <laughs> <laughs> did, you, um, how, did you have any choices other than the pink um, choice for the cover and kind of what went into it? Um, yeah, and how did that shape, I guess, the um, <laughs> themes of the book without giving maybe too much away? I just looked at my agent to be like, is this the time I give the politician answer? <laughs> um, look, Listen, hey, you haven't signed an NDA, so I <laughs> Hey, look, Smil. what I've learned about publishing, which is beautiful, is that it takes a bigger village than I even thought to make a book. And I wish something that I hope in the paperback or something is that we can do what I've seen other books doing and publish the credits of all the people that make a book in this. And I didn't, I was a bit blind to that, I think, before in publishing. I knew that that exists in theatre. And there's just so many steps to putting out a book that I didn't know. And you write the book first and then the cover conversation happens. And it's a conversation with a lot of voices because there's a lot of people that care about the book at that point. Um, Aesthetic is like my, my vibe. I love, this was never gonna be a cover that I wasn't happy about because image is so important to me and it's such a, as we talked about, it's such a powerful tool. There were other versions and I think the 
common, I'll say, is all the versions came from a good place, but maybe they symbolized the same thing that I tackle in the book, the book that we think it's going to be, and then the book that I actually write. And I think that in, because trans literature isn't new, but trans literature in this current moment, in this canon, in this publishing world is new in this form, it's about trusting that the reader can find what you want to find, right? Like, that sometimes I think we think that trans people have to always be in a place of education. So maybe some of the earlier versions were doing a lot of that. Whereas, if I'm honest, I wanted something just bold, chic, and, like, cute. <laughs> like, and, you know, obviously the box, like, when you think of none of the above, you think of the box, so that had to be in there. But to be honest, this is my favourite colour. <laughs> um, and also that, like, there's this thing, oh, it's none of the above. Do we need to pick a gender-neutral colour? Like, do we need to pick something that... Pink is obviously pink, like, with the history. But I was like, baby, pink is pink, with the history. And pink is... It's not going to be blue. But, um, yeah, I can't really lie. I just picked it. This cover was obviously, like, designed by... And we went back and forth, and the design is incredible. But also, it just looks hot. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's cool to hold. <laughs> Yeah. OK. Have we got any questions from this side? Because I'm trying not to forget you, you guys over there. None? OK, well, keep the cog turning. Oh, it, OK, we do. Hi. Hi, yeah. Hi. Um, earlier, you were speaking about um, reimagining, and you spoke about uh, the liminal step, like being in a liminal space. And I wondered if you were to reimagine what would that liminal space be like, mm. if, like for society or wider? Wow, such a good question. <laughs> Um, it's a vast one. It's yeah. a big question. I think I'll say that the main thing I was imagining and hoping for when writing this, where I would experience safety and others would as well, is a liminal space where you're allowed to change your mind and contradict yourself. And that you're allowed to change into a version of yourself that would disagree with past you and then change back to past you. That change was seen as like a natural and celebrated thing rather than a feared thing and that change wouldn't feel as heavy, right? I think that, especially obviously around our gender, I think that we would all breathe lighter if the choices we made around gender could be lighter as well. Mm. And if the, the choices we made didn't have to last forever, or they could, and we could change our mind. And so for me, I want us all to be in a space of trans transit and a space of change, and a space of never staying in one spot, because that's kind of where we already all are. It's just for some reason that we have to lie and say we're not, right? And so, yeah, the liminal space I imagine is when we're all just in flux. It's interesting what happens when, like, your cis friend hangs out with loads of trans people for a week. Suddenly they'd be, like, drawing on their moustache one day, changing it up the other, going, I think I'm they, she. I think I'm she slash they. They'd be given the, like, little pronoun mix-up. Mm. It's on the fourth day in the pronoun circle, and they're like, I think I'm actually she slash they. And you see, like, a little hint of them, and you're like, bish, yeah, step into it. And then maybe next week you're not. And, like, how free is that? Because it all kind of means stuff, but it also kind of doesn't. And I think my liminal space would, like, take it's serious in the sense of take what you believe serious and also know that this is all quite silly, you know. Yeah. Are there any internet questions? Oh, God, okay. no. Anyone from Reddit? <laughs> <laughs> and then we'll get back to the, to the crowd. Thank you. I think this follows on from that word you mentioned, canon. And I think this book is definitely going to be part of the LGBT canon for a very, very long time, which is really exciting. But we have a question, which is, your, who... When you were writing this book, who was your canon that you referred to? What, what books before, which authors before were James, you thinking of? James Baldwin, hands down. Like, I remember my brother, who puts the A in ally, um, <laughs> giving me James Baldwin books when I was, like, 15, and it, like, changing my whole world and changing everything and just making me feel like there was a space in form to change. I think that non-fiction and fiction is, again, if we're doing none of the above non-binary, it's not really a binary that makes sense. I don't look at non-fiction writers as not also being storytellers and writing and changing mm. form. And I felt like James Baldwin does that like so beautifully. Some of the work that you read of his that feels like fiction is actually like deeply historical. Um, the same with like Bell Hooks' work as well. Um, I read a lot of Bell Hooks in lockdown, reread. And I feel like 
her work as well is consistently telling you don't get comfortable with what you think this form is. And yeah, I think LGBTQ issues aside, it's actually a reason why I picked this publisher is that when they were comparing the books and the quotes, they weren't just picking it based off of like who I look like or like what other identities I shared. They mentioned books that like, after reading my sample, they mentioned books that were doing something with form that I felt was linked to this. And so yeah, definitely James Baldwin. I'm like, I think he made me a writer. Yeah, that feels a bit corny to say, but I think he did, yeah. Mm, Bell Hooks, we really lost a legend, you know. Truly. RIP. Okay, we've got a question here at the front, and then I'm gonna come to you in the back. You're next. Hey, Travis. Hey, babe. Um, I remember seeing you many, 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 many years ago in maybe uh, Goldsmiths or somewhere like that. You were performing, very nervous. It was very new, but you were still as amazing. And I remember you saying something like you wanted to, ex to exist. <sighs> you wanted to navigate this earth without... I think you said without teaching, you just wanted to exist. You wanted to feel joy in the way that people who are maybe gender conforming do. So in terms of your book, are we going to get any kind of fiction work where we've got perhaps trans, trans non-binary, gender non-conforming folk who are waking up, brushing their teeth, smiling, finding love, skipping, hopping, or are we going to have more... Um, I don't want to say this is teaching, but there is an element, because even I, as a trans non-binary person, I'm, you know, I learn from you. So, any fiction? Do you mean in this book or future work? Future, babe. Oh, babies, I hope. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. The, thing about, the thing about fiction is I think it takes longer, yeah. and I'm trying to write, maybe not, I have not got another book on the go, I can't lie. I'm, so you've got to take a break after this. I respect that. Yeah, it's not I, every day produce, produce. I can't. I don't know how. You need to live life. You need input in order to have output, right? I text, need trans joy. Yeah, right. Well, <laughs> well, I'm writing for, like, TV, but they got to say yes. But that's comedy. Like, that's where I get to see my comedy and my shows. I think mm. theatre is where I do a lot of that. Um, I don't know if I'll be writing fiction anytime like, soon, because I think... Um, I didn't realise how exhausting the process would be of, like, the book thing was hard, but then, like, you know, this was two years. It's a long process. I text all my author mates that, like, churn one out, like, every year, and I was like, I don't know, are you all right? <laughs> <laughs> Who's your ghostwriter? Like, do you have one? Yeah, uh, but I think, look, I've got a really amazing comedy series that I'm writing at the moment for TV. They just got to want it, you know? Careful, and Evil Eye. Evil Eye, oh. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously, we're all rooting for you, but... Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, sometimes so I'm sometimes. worried about the forces. The for well, the force. <laughs> yeah, that is true. I got a shit comedy series coming out. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think that my fiction space has always been on the stage and other areas, and I think that's where it'll be rather than the book for now. Um, I really want to write a kids' book eventually. That's Stay where I want to go. <laughs> Stay in your lane. Is that what you said? Is that what you're doing? <laughs> I want to write a kids' book after your kids' book. <laughs> um, but yeah, not for now. Um, you just get my emo non-fiction. <laughs> I feel like, you know, also, you know, Travis is only 26 years old. Like, we're talking long career, like, you know. So Let me take some time off. <laughs> I feel like, I mean, I don't know, but yeah. you've still got so much, you know, to offer us. Yeah, um, yeah, definitely. Life is long. Life is, I, I know, and I've got to slow it down a bit. <laughs> oh, no, you don't have to slow down, but I'm excited, you know, to see Thank what you. what comes next. Okay, so question over here. The, yes, I promised you that you were next. <laughs> Hi. Hello. Um, forgive me if I jumble this up. I'm quite nervous. You're good. Um, me too. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Um, you just speak so delicately about, like, the relationship with self, your relationship with self. Um, and I feel like... Um, sort of being the uh, the disruptor or like the canon um, can be a load of responsibility. Um, and I just am so impressed and bewildered by how wonderful it is to hear someone kind of be led so much by the self. Um, but I wonder like what what gave you I don't know, the moment of, I want to bring this to the collective, or I want to like take this and, and write this book and bring it forth, and yeah. 
Thanks for such a nice question. I like the statement before because it builds me up a bit. Um, <laughs> See, I'm in favour of statements as long as there's questions. Yeah, yeah, that was yeah, a good yeah. statement. That was good. That yeah. was good. That was good. Um, I want to give you like a really like good answer back, but I'll be honest, I don't think it's intentionally about that stuff. I really just focus on like what I need to make. And I don't really focus too much, if I'm honest, about what could or couldn't be the impact. And sometimes that can disappoint people in an answer, but it's not because I don't care and like I'm, I'm really grateful, but I do just think it sometimes makes stale art if you think too much about this imagined impact because it also individualizes you in a way that doesn't really make sense. There's loads of artists that are saying what I'm saying in lots of different ways. And so I'm just making and saying it in this way. And I think growing up, when I became an artist, I was around like the DIY, queer performance scene. I was introduced by, I was thinking about it this morning, this incredible artist called Jacob V. Joyce, who was part of an amazing punk scene called, yeah, Claps and it, Skimming Toenail. And they, I remember it kind of felt like surreal, like trip, but I wasn't on drugs, mum. <laughs> and I, she's not here, but she might be tuning in live. She's really obsessed with this book tour. <laughs> um, and they brought me into this garage in South London and I first moved to London. And there was all these performers like doing all these different things, jumping up on the mic, jumping off, saying similar things, but in different ways. And I started to be like, oh, I could do this. And I think if your art is born in a collective experience, you never think too much about your individual impact because I'm thinking about so many artists when I'm writing. I'm just like, oh, this is my form. And then this is their form and this is theirs and this is theirs. Then it comes out in the world and everyone else just decides to split it up into this is a book and this is theater and this is music and this is this. But if you come from a collective that was molding all those things, you don't think of your work as like doing one thing over someone else. You just think it as, this is my skill set. I'm quite good at speaking in front of people. Um, my mix of probably privileges, campy aesthetic and humor meant that other people then did it on a bigger scale. And this is my way, I would be shit at doing it at an underground club in South London still, because I'm afraid of crowds now. So you just have different skills and this is my skill. And yeah, I don't know if that answered your question, but I don't really think of myself in that way. I think you just got to make the art first. That's it really, you just make the art first. Okay, do we have any internet questions? Okay, our internet person, please. We, um, we actually have a question from Rugby Library. Okay. I thought you meant, sorry, I thought you meant from a rugby team. I was like, <laughs> I was like okay, whoa. They Bristol's might be tuning in. Bristol's haunting me, okay. <laughs> um, sent me. This might be like uh, choosing a, a favourite <laughs> child, but of all the work and all the forms of work that you've done so far, all your performances and now this writing, do you have a kind of favourite experience of a favourite piece that you've done? It's none of the above, available to buy <laughs> online and after this performance. <laughs> um, I should give that answer, shouldn't I? But I'll be mm. honest, um, this was really hard to write and I'm, re I'm not reaping the, the emotional reward yet because this is the first event. I'm still processing it. I'll be processing it for a long time, so I'd be lying if I said this one. This is really cool, though. <laughs> but it's got to be Burgos. Like... <laughs> Like, that changed my whole time. I see my director in the audience, Sam. Like, it just changed my life. And it like, made me think that I could do this for a, a long time. And the show that keeps on giving, it's, like, just been signed to, like, there's going to be someone else acting on it in Australia now, and they're That's performing so exciting, it. Yeah. And I got to talk. I got to see the world. I got to, like, have loads of fun. I got to believe that I was an artist, like... It changed, it gave me a lot of privileges as well. It meant that I could work full time as an artist. Yeah, it's burgers all day, every day, but second, close second is none of the above. <laughs> uh, that was a really good internet question. Yeah, it fucked okay. me up, didn't it? Um, <laughs> okay, uh, well, I'm gonna go to you, and then we'll go to you. Because we've got like loads of time for questions. For a very generous British library. But can I get a time check from any member of staff? Because Hmm? It's okay, oh, so can I we think. be, can we still go for like 20 minutes or, okay. Keep thinking of questions, people. Okay, go on. Hi, um, I really love, Travis, how you talk about joy. And I think it resonates with a lot of people because I think joy is one of the main things we search for when we're figuring out this whole gender thing. I know I certainly do. And I wanted to ask what, 
the most joyful thing about being who you are is, or what one of the most joyful things for you is? My shoe collection. <laughs> no, 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 sorry, sorry, that was a knee jerk. Um, honestly, like the people you meet, I really think that anytime you feel too disempowered as like a LGBTQ person with the state of the world, it's very easy to, it's very easy to look at our government and feel all these things. And then you just have to go to a straight wedding. <laughs> and you're like, oh, I've picked the right side, actually. Uh, if there was a side, I think I went to a queer wedding recently. I was like, oh, this is what's up, you know? Uh, shout out Tom and Shugs. Um, but uh, I think that it's the people. I am a sum of all the people I've met. And queer people are, like, so cool. Because that autonomy I'm talking about in the book every queer person I've met has their own journey to that autonomy too, because they've had to. And then so to be surrounded by people that have had to fight for their autonomy is like both overwhelming and no wonder the queer drama is so sizzling. But <laughs> it's also like so energizing and inspiring. I feel like a smarter person because I'm surrounded by queer people. I feel like a kinder person. Definitely feel like a better like lover and friend because of queer people. So it's the friends every single time you know, every time. And even not just friends. I feel like queer people, I don't know, because I'm not straight. Maybe straights, you can say, you do this too. Um, but, like, I feel like queers also know more people. Or, like, we just, like, you know, like, we don't rely... Our, our, our definitions of friendship and family is just not, not bound in the same way. And so there's loads of people in the room here that I can spot. And, yeah, I might not text them, like, every day, but they're here when we, like, love each other and we, like, know we do. And that feels specifically like queer and it's quite emotional actually, like because they're, they're here at this thing and it's not a stranger, but it's also not, I guess, a friend. So that must mean it's just like a queer family member that you like have a bond to and you know, so that's the, that's the tea. Oh, I'm, a, I'm not gonna be emotional every first event. It is okay. the first event, it's a bit wild. <laughs> so that's what's going on. You, Great. We're gonna go for one more question. Okay. It's a fun one. Great. <laughs> Okay, fabulous. <laughs> I'll gonna, by the way, sorry, I'll take like two seconds, but I will be at the book signing and yeah. I will do that. That will be fun and nice. I just gotta like take a two sec. Of course. Yeah. Will stories of a queer brown laddy kid ever make a comeback? <laughs> <laughs> that was okay, my friends are really stepping up, clearly. <laughs> For context, Stories of a Queer by Muddy Kid was something I tried to get published uh, when I was like 19. Um, it was like a children's book, actually illustrated the original version by my friend Denny in the room. Um, I guess, you know what, what I'm learning about my work is it reappears in lots of different forms all the time. And um, I think if there ever was a children's story, it would definitely, we did, it turned actually, there is, you know, it would turn into that story. So yes, it would, and thanks for being a supportive friend and listening to those early days. <laughs> um, Manny, I just want to really thank you as well. This has been set the bar really high for the first event. Thank you, I have so much respect for you and love for you. Thank you. Thank you all so, so much. This has been beautiful. I'll be there in a bit. I'm going to have two minutes.